1992, and this will be the second underground interview with Al Bilek, uh, coming to you directly from the American Academy of Dissident Sciences. Al, would you summarize for our viewers very briefly, for these that have not seen your first underground tape, uh, what was the Philadelphia experiment and what was your part in it? Because all of our discussion in this second interview would be about what happened later and about some other uh, projects that basically have not been commented uh, about so far. Okay, very briefly, the Philadelphia Experiment was a project undertaken by the Navy during the war years, which had its early and original genesis in 1931 in Chicago, was moved to the Institute of Advanced Studies in 1934 in Princeton, New Jersey. And by 1940, they had a functional test which proved they could produce invisibility on a Navy ship. That was Rainbow One. They classified it and made it a project called Project Rainbow. In March of 42, with Nikola Tesla having been the director since 34, he was to have a test of invisibility on a battleship. He deliberately sabotaged it because he refused to be responsible for the loss of life which he expected due to the extremely high electromagnetic power and energies involved to produce the invisibility effect. So Van Neumann took over and in 1943, after a lot of preparation in the late, mid to late 42 and 43, they held the first test in July 22nd, 43, which was fully successful. The ship became invisible to radar as well as to the site and to a camera. But they had some personnel problems, not super bad, but nevertheless, those on deck were nauseous and ill <clears throat> and had to be removed after the ship returned to the dock. The final test was 12 August 1943 and that one was a total disaster. Uh, after it disappeared and remained in hyperspace for some four hours by linear measured time in 1943, it returned. And there were some crew members missing, others on fire. Mind all those on deck were crazy, insane, except myself who just come back. And uh, from that point on, the Navy, after one more aborted test late in October, washed the hands of the entire thing and scrapped the project and sent the Elvish to sea as a regular destroyer after re-outfitting it. Now the project was dropped in 43 due to the very bad and disastrous results and in 47 it was uh, taken up again at the request of the Navy. Dr. von Neumann was asked to look into it and see if he could find out what really went wrong and if anything could be salvaged. He did find what went wrong, and since he was already working on a computer design from 1946 at the Institute of Advanced Study, he continued his work. The computer designs were completed in 1952. The first model was built, the second one went to England, and I think the third went to the Navy Department and in 1953 with a totally new design, having been working on several projects simultaneously. They had a final test with the Navy and a totally new project in which there was no personnel interaction. They had full invisibility radar, not optical, and everybody was happy because there was no problem. So then we classified the project again and called it Project Phoenix. And that name, code name, Project Phoenix, became the genesis and the coverall for a multitude of sins and a multitude of projects which the government shoveled under that umbrella. They had everything from uh, mind control projects to invisibility project that is a continuation of the Philadelphia experiment to time uh, travel problems and time travel systems and time tunnels and, and uh, attempts at uh, crossbreeding humans with reptilians and a few other little strange things all came under that umbrella. So that is very basically and very quickly what happened with the Philadelphia Project. The Philadelphia Experiment, as it is called, was a disaster because it locked up with the Phoenix Project, which was running 
uh, through 1977 to 83, but in the last month of its running, the last 12 days in August, from August 1 to August 12, Phoenix Project was online continuously without let-up. And on the 12th of August, 1983, the two projects locked up, pulled the Eldridge into hyperspace, where it remained for some four hours by standard measured linear time. On deck or on Earth? Yeah, out in uh, hyperspace. It was not on Earth. Yeah. It was in a limbo condition. And Duncan and I were running the equipment on board the Eldridge. When we saw it, it was totally uncontrollable and out of control, and we couldn't shut it off. We jumped overboard, wound up in 1983 at the Phoenix Project, stayed there about half a day, and we were sent back to the Elders to smash the equipment, return the ship to 1943. While this was coming out of the fields, in the fog, and the equipment was running down because enough was destroyed that nothing would run anymore, as the field started to dissipate, we found, of course, four men buried in the steel as we went out on deck again, and a fifth man with his hand on a steel bulkhead, and a lot of other insanity all over the place, maybe running around totally in gibberish, insane. Some of the guys were burning, some were disappearing and reappearing, and it was a total disaster. Duncan took one look at this, jumped overboard, went to 1983, as later records showed, and that was before the fields totally collapsed. He was still able to get back. He didn't want any part of what he saw. The real reason for that, why he deserted ship, so to speak, and went back to the future, no pun intended on the movie, has been a subject of debate now for some six years since we became aware of the interlocking projects, actually from about 88 onward, why did he return to 83? The best answer I've been able to come up with was the fact that in the period of 1943, between the first and the second test of the Eldridge, then uh, the Chief of Naval Operations, who was Admiral King, issued an order, which I found out about in the last few months, to the effect that if the second test was a failure, nobody was to leave the Eldridge alive. In other words, he proposed to kill everybody. Well, this was uh, interdicted by a higher level order from the highest level of the Navy, which was the Secretary of the Navy, then James Forrestal, who countermanded the order. Duncan apparently knew about the original order, and I suspect did not know about the second order, and jumped overboard in a panic, thinking we're all doomed anyway, and looked at me before he jumped overboard like, well, aren't I coming along? I didn't. So it changed, in many respects, history, and definitely changed our personal history. Duncan was reborn later in 1951 in another body, and after he went through many escapades with the military and the Air Force from the time of age 18, which was 1978 onward, uh, 68 onward, he left the Air Force and eventually wound up as part of the Phoenix Project in uh, mid-70s. I became... Again, yeah, in his second incarnation. So. In his second incarnation, as Duncan in the same name, the, the first and the second Duncans were the same name, Alexander Duncan Cameron, Jr., father saw to that. And the second one was named that, according to what he told his fifth wife, who was Duncan's mother, in memory of a son who had died in World War II. And this is not a natural incarnation. No, it was not natural in any way made by machines, by some technology, by the government? Uh, by aliens, uh, combining with the government, part of the Phoenix Project. Now, if you want to get into some of the other commentaries, many of the things which have come to light in the last few years have made this entire operation called Project Phoenix and the carry-on of the Philadelphia experiment, also Project Phoenix now, more than a little bit bizarre. When they perfected, that is, when they made a working experiment that was without hitch, without glitch, and without problems for personnel, of course the project became of great interest to the Navy and to other military services. After several generations of revamping, 
they finally came up with what is today commonly called the stealth technology. Now, the stealth technology basically involves not only... The, the real stealth technology. Yes, it involves not only special coatings placed on the stealth fighter and the stealth bomber, but also the full invisibility technology, which is on the B-1 bomber, has been for many years, and the B-2, which is the stealth, on Navy, every Navy fighter aircraft in the fleet, on every fighter aircraft the Israelis have, on a number of other Air Force crafts, and all of the super carriers. And this technology is now reduced to the uh, portable size where an individual can be made invisible. So it's gone through many generations of uh, revamping and shrinking of the size of the equipment, which says two things. One, solid state technology has become of age, and you are now able to do in a very small package things that it once took a huge pile of equipment to do. Secondly, they've modified the equipment to some extent so that it is now possible to make it portable and still completely effective. What the principles now are that they're using, I don't know. I don't know if it bears a resemblance to the original procedures or not, but they do have it working. In fact, there's even a famous photo available of uh, President Bush and his Secret Service man out fishing at Kennepunk Port, Maine, in the surf. And in between the two of them, there is a fishing pole standing there, fishing with nobody hanging on to it, quite invisible hands holding it up. This is rather a famous picture, and uh, it is uh, there. It has been published, uh, publicized in a couple of newspapers, and merely goes to show that the government has rather good control over this sort of thing. There are other stories, not apocryphal, but real. Yeah, this is the famous picture. Right. Famous picture, and... We see the... Yeah, you see the president on the right in his pink shirt, Secret Service man on the left with his arms crossed, and the fishing pole standing there all by itself in the surf. And uh, it's very strange. Uh, if you look closely, you will see down in the water there are splash marks around invisible feet. Right between the two, yes, right there. Now the angle seems a little bit off in terms of the way the poles are fishing, but we don't have the full picture of exactly what bay they were in or where this was and exactly where their lines were actually anchored. But this now can be done by either one of two techniques. One, hardware, or the second one, I understand, is they can put the human... That is a Secret Service man through a special processing where without hardware he becomes invisible for about 72 hours. And then he starts to do the invisible man number and start to come back into visibility and also he gets, uh, I understand, violently ill when in the process of coming back to, quote, normalcy, unquote. Either way, they have control over processes of, of invisibility. Hangover. You might have a very powerful invisible hangover, and the hangover is not invisible to the, peer, the person who has to withstand it. This is only one of the aspects of many things which have occurred. One very interesting thing here that comes to my attention is that if all carriers and if all planes are equipped with this invisibility, which basically is also a teleportation technique, then uh, practically all confrontation on this planet become impossible because you cannot fight a fleet that can hop around the world oceans at will, just flipping the numbers. Flipping the dials and showing up somewhere else yeah. after turning on the invisibility. There's more than one report of this, of a fleet going invisible in the Pacific, off radar, off optical view by private aircraft that happen to be flying in the area. And the fleet shows up a day later, so a couple of thousand miles away, and uh, steaming and under completely normal conditions where it doesn't appear like anything has happened, just so they've changed location in the meantime. And they were totally off full radar, not visible, and could not be tracked in that period of time. They made a quick jump of some type and were there. How they explain this to the sailors, I don't know. How they explain to the personnel on board the ship 
that are not in on the equipment because these big carriers and larger ships, everybody does not know about the equipment, only a handful of personnel, including the skipper, of course. Maybe this film, uh, uh, the final countdown, countdown, gives an idea of how this is explained. They simply said that it was a whirlwind, a cyclone with some time-changing characteristics that moved the ship back in time to the Pearl Harbor. Attack. Yes, that uh, film purported to be fictional, and they got away with it, you might say, by showing it as a freak of nature. Well, nature does not engage in those kind of freaks, not so far as we know at any time. My information was that it was a real test. They had the equipment on board. It was the Nimitz, and they were the first ones to be so equipped. And they went back into the past on direct orders to the day before Pearl Harbor with the intent whoever gave the orders that the aircraft on the Nimitz would wipe out the invading Japanese fleet before there was an attack and prevent the attack and thereby change history. Well, as it showed in the movie, uh, one of the civilian observers along was arguing with the captain. He says, do you want to play God and change all history? He says, if you do, he says, you don't know how many people will be living who uh, might otherwise have died in the attack and you can change the, the whole structure as it were of uh, our history and the possible outcome of the war and uh, nonetheless in the actual uh, movie the skipper did not win he started to the attack but then in the movie the natural phenomena closed in on him and the attack was cancelled. In fact, I understand that the skipper got cold feet and called off the attack and pulled the ships into you know, the planes back and then returned the ship to current time. So basically, it, I mean, all these things show that if these things are real, that uh, oh, the whole Cold War has been a very clever Mickey Mouse game between the two superpowers in order to siphon tremendous amount of funding into these black projects because technically I mean both superpowers are armed with armed with these uh, uh, advanced technologies you cannot literally fight the war or you can destroy the whole planet but my my, my important point is what, what, what do you think about the mm, well the recent revelations from so many places that Basically, this whole war has been a very clever arrangement between the, between the, super, the two superpowers that have been transferring technology behind the scenes. Are you referring to World War II? Or and after that. Not after. after. Insofar, as, insofar as World War II is concerned, I would say yes. There was a great deal of covert transfer of technology, not just before, but during the war. Before the war, it was not covert. During the war, it was covert, and then after the war, of course, we seized everything because Nazi Germany surrendered. Uh, that is, the Nazi group surrendered Germany. They did not surrender, period. The Nazis never surrendered, which is one of the best-kept secrets of history. They merely moved out of Germany and went to Antarctica and took all their best projects and hardware with them. But insofar as the covert technology transfer is concerned, there's a great deal of evidence that there was a continuing covert transfer of personnel. My father was in on some of this uh, smuggling of people out of Germany to the U.S. During, prior to and during the early part of World War II. And with it, some of the technology, because the Germans developed their own time machine in 1945. We developed the equivalent of it with the Philadelphia experiment in 43 and an actual one in 44. Could these two projects have been secretly coordinated from a higher level so that to compare notes and to see which one would do it better? That would be true, except for the fact the Germans had no invisibility project. Uh, there's no evidence they had one of any kind, but there is some partial evidence to the effect that there may have been an attempt by a Nazi sympathizer to steal the Eldridge in the final test and take it out to sea and turn it over to the Germans. Or maybe it may have been an attempt by the American power elite to transfer this technology to Germany as there have been many such cases in history of transferring super uh, technologies to Russia before the Second World War, during the Second World War, after the Second World War mm -hmm. in order to boost up Germany's uh, resistance. 
possibly true. Um, the problem with that is, however, that while at some higher level there was covert uh, cooperation, and during the war, of course, there was a great deal of cooperation between the U.S. and the USSR, and they were given, literally, some 25 pounds of purified uranium before the war was over. And the, the, Russians. the Russians were, and that was the material which was eventually used to uh, develop the first atomic bomb in 1949. But uh, this type of cooperation there was between uh, uh, allies, between Germany and the United States. There was a different story. You had financial interests and industrial interests who were so heavily uh, entrenched in the, world financial, in the world's financial structure and in the industrial structure that there were deliberate orders out that there were certain bomb targets in Germany and that you did not bomb. And I'm not talking about the concentration camps that did not bomb, but the actual industrial targets which were immune from being bombed throughout the war. The question is why and who gave those orders? Obviously, they didn't come from the general. They didn't come from Eisenhower. They didn't come from anyone in Italy, in Germany, or Italy, or England. They came from some level above, where I don't know. Or the case of the German ball bearings that were stripped of the, their swastika stamp and used in American machines, or high-grade American uh, aviation carous um, gasoline ship in American ships with German crews to Germany for the Luftwaffe. Well, that part I didn't hear about until very, very recently. But if that is another example of the type of uh, undercover cooperation due to industrial interests uh, to keep the war going, then yes, there was definitely covert cooperation at military levels, which the public didn't know about and most of the military didn't know about. We also have the fine example of the Germans developing jet aircraft in 1939 operational. And they had uh, jet fighter aircraft and two-engine fighter craft and jet bombers by 1941-42. And, and, and rockets by, and by 43, which were ready to go on production in 41. And this was before the British ever heard about a jet engine. In fact, they only heard about it because the Germans were building them. And they probably captured one. And at that point, they tried to replicate it. They couldn't. They went to a different design, which was grossly inferior, the British design that was changed much later. But they did not have the correct design. The Americans, I understand, did proceed with the design very much according to the original German designs. Guess where did they get the drawings? I couldn't imagine. Uh, much of this sort of thing went on. You also had, in terms of some of the more bizarre projects, you had attempts in Germany, which were becoming quite successful at uh, mind modification. Not strict mind control, but mind modification in terms of indoctrination, which was used by uh, the SS masters to indoctrinate the SS troops in their special rooms where they were being impinged by 27 kilohertz high-frequency energy off of special loudspeaker systems, which hit them in the rear of the head. I would like to add a little comment here on the transfer of technology and then we will turn to mind control. Uh, it's very interesting to notice, according to a study by an American professor from a major Ivy League university, I, uh, I think it was a Princeton University professor, uh, that studied uh, Russian armaments industry from the 20s all the way to the 50s. And in his monumental academic work, he, among other things, he noticed that 14 out of the 15 munition plants in uh, Germany at the start of the Second World War, were, uh, I'm sorry, in Russia, 14 out of the f 15 munition plants in Russia were built by German technology, with German money, expertise, uh, know-how, engineers, and uh, management. And even to these days, the AK-47, the Kalashnikov submachine gun, uh, fires with bullets that are the original German Mannlicher uh, bullets for the rifle that the Germans had uh, during the First World War. So basically the Russians fought the whole Second World War with munition produced in, in German munition plants. After the war, I've heard stories that, for example, uh, Rolls-Royce sold a whole factory for jet engines to Russia because the Russians were way behind even behind the uh, British, and the British were behind the Germans. 
uh, just in time for the Korean War. So the whole Korean War was fought with MiG planes that had their engines built in a factory somewhere in Russia that was delivered by Rolls-Royce. Later on, I've heard stories about a whole nuclear submarine being sold to the Russians secretly in the 70s to boost up their submarine fleet because they were lagging pretty much behind. And so this Cold War confrontation was not very real. Everybody in the Pentagon knew that the Russians are behind in submarine production, so funding could not be uh, appropriated by Congress for new construction. Or way back in the f uh, late 40s when the Russian uh, ambassador stole a nuclear warhead, a nuclear bomb, and smuggled it out of Washington in his suitcase and onto the plane. All these things do not happen by coincidence or through sheer geniusness of the Russian secret services. They are cleverly orchestrated and arranged on at a higher level, conspiratorial level, higher than the leadership of the CIA or the KGB, uh, in order to coordinate this Cold War and to have the two adverse adversaries basically equally strong so that money could continue to be appropriated by both the American Congress and the Supreme Soviet. And this has been going on for all these years. My personal feeling is that behind the scenes a massive space program uh, of the two superpowers with the uh, cooperation and participation of other countries has been going on. And what we see in Star Trek as a fictional reality is probably a Monday, every day, nine to five uh, jobs for a limited select group of uh, elite intelligence personnel and elite scientists uh, in both Russia and the United States. But I would like to have you all discuss a little bit more about the German uh, mind control projects uh, and how they were later carried on uh, in the United States. Okay, the initial work that I know of that was uh, carried on by the Germans involved the use of sound techniques which produced a semi-hypnotic effect on the persons, groups in the SS being indoctrinated so that the indoctrination training would take more readily. This equipment at the end of World War II was captured by what they call the Buck Rogers flying teams that went all over Russia, uh, Germany looking for new technology, things that they wanted to bring home to the United States. Quite aside from the 30 railroad cars full of patents and paperwork which they brought back to the U.S., they found all kinds of little interesting pieces of hardware. And one of them was this indoctrination hardware which wound up in Los Angeles, went to the Technicolor Corporation to replicate the electronics. And the speakers, which were very specialized, wound up with Altec Lansing to be duplicated. I know this because of a certain friend of mine who was involved in the project at some level at the time. And after they analyzed what had been built and how it worked and how it worked on the human head, the hardware was replicated, went into production, and nobody knows where it went. But it was used, of course, in the U.S. somewhere. Exactly where is an unknown at this point. The other factors that go on is, of course, the Germans started this. The Japanese also had their own program going using a totally different approach. They were using microwave energy, a special technique working on the head. I do not know how successful they might have been, but the project was taken over by the U.S. at the end of the war and swept totally under the rug with a complete silence. The work continued, basically, at Brookhaven National Laboratory, starting about 1947. And there they had already in place, having been smuggled from across the ocean from Germany, a considerable number of refugee German Jewish scientists. And they were part of the mind control projects and certain other projects. They went to work at Brookhaven, Brookhaven being a national laboratory, to work on the continuation of mind control techniques. Now, since uh, Brookhaven is a national laboratory, it is funded by tax money, federal funds, they therefore have to make a report every month as to what they're doing, all the projects underway, and a general report of progress, lack thereof, or whatever. And this went on for some 20 years. 
And then after approximately 20 years, or close to that, somebody in Congress decides to start reading these reports. Instead of just stuffing, stuffing them in some cubby hole, they started reading them. They found out about mind control. At that point, somebody in Congress blew their lid and said, what is mind control? If they're building this sort of stuff, they might use it on us. Cancel the project. The project was canceled, and the scientists were thrown out of Brookhaven. And they were looking, of course, for a new home to continue their research. And they found it not far from Brookhaven, which was in the eastern half of Long Island. They went a little further east to a location called Montauk area, and there there was a military base called Fort Hero, which was operational. There was an Army base and an Air Force base at that time. The Army part of the base had been there since before World War I. The Navy was there with submarine pens since before World War I. But the Air Force moved in in the early 60s with some uh, specialized radar systems. They were testing long range over the ocean, and eventually the SAGE system was moved in there about 1963. And that was decommissioned about 68, 69, because they went to the uh, Dew Line project in Canada, still longer range and further north, and all of the SAGE systems around the U.S. were dropped. In that interim, the base was abandoned, was held as surplus property by the General Services Administration, and this group who was already there stayed. The Mine Control Group. The Mine Control Group. And they continue their projects. Now, other projects under the Phoenix Project, and I can, cannot say I know all of those which have been put under that little umbrella. Phase one was mine control, and that was moved to Montauk. That is to that location at the abandoned base. Would you comment a little bit on the other German inroads into mine control, namely the usage of cocaine, the regular usage of cocaine by their uh, officers and engineers? Well, there you get into a very touchy subject because... In the United States today, cocaine is considered a controlled substance and a drug which will do you harm. I know a British scientist who came over to the U.S. prior to or just slightly after World War II, and when he was going through school, he regularly used cocaine. He said everybody in England did. Nobody had any bad effects from it. Nobody considered it a drug, and nobody considered it harmful. That is, after all, a derivative of cocoa, and a cocoa leaf. And while it is a sort of energy and psychic booster, they used it to stay up all night and uh, study for his exams and then be out bright and early and never going to bed to his classes the next morning to take his exams, and he passed them. Now, this was not limited to England. It was also being used in Europe and in Germany, and at that time there was no control on the substance prior to World War II and for some time thereafter. And it was regularly used by a lot of these people as a sort of psychic booster. Now here you get into a very delicate matter in terms of the medical interpretation of what cocaine, not talking about other drugs, other hardcore drugs, but cocaine itself as to whether or not it is habit-forming or not. And I understand generally considered it is not habit-forming in the use or misuse by young people under the age of 21. It can lead to the use of other harder, more dangerous drugs, but of itself might not be considered so dangerous. None of the reports by the LaGuardia Commission in the 30s in New York indicated there was any problem for marijuana or from some of these other drugs, and they were then, at that point, wide open in usage. There was no control on them in the 30s, in the U.S. or elsewhere, to my knowledge. The controls on these were only established after World War II and would not come down as a tight, hard control with the uh, controlled substance laws we now have until 1965. It was that late. And that, of course, included LSD and many of the other mind-bending drugs, but cocaine was not in that category. These people use it regularly as an energy booster and to sharpen their wits, their mentality, and, 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 and po possibly meditation. Definitely uh, some of these compounds, particularly peyote, as one example, an LSD is a synthetic, but peyote was a natural derivative from the peyote mushroom, was definitely used and still is used by the American Indians as a part of their rights, but it has been used by many people experimentally in the past as a means for expanding the human consciousness and looking into other areas beyond the normal physical reality. The, uh, government, the government couldn't have this for one simple reason. They were interfering with the CIA's MK Ultra program and certain other programs the CIA was involved with, 
which involved mind manipulation. And if you get somebody with an expanded mind, with more awareness and more understanding, they will be able to see through these other programs. But if you cut off the means... Somebody patched your memory. Right. Somebody if you cut off the use of these materials, weather availability, then you're not going to be able to uh, take a better look around you. You might not be able to find out that your mind has been tampered with on one of the government projects, which were rampant in the U.S. and Canada, in Canada from the CIA from the late 40s uh, onward. And it's basically the chemical drug aspects from the mid, early to mid-50s. And MK Ultra was only one program. There were many others. You also had other programs underway, which started in 47, went on through 52, uh, for finding the basis for changing the memory structure, changing the personality completely and totally if the CIA or whatever agency wanted to do this. And these programs were instituted by Dr. Wilhelm Reich in, New Year, in uh, Rangeley, Maine in 1947 when he signed a five-year contract with the CIA to do research, which was according to what he was given to understand at the beginning, at the initial point, the CIA was, quote, interested in two aspects. One was uh, development of psychic ability, finding a means to improve or enhance psychic ability. The second part was they wanted to find a means to deprogram people who had been programmed. To brainwash them? Uh, well, they didn't, old memories. they didn't state that to Reich, but he soon found out that's what they wanted. And he blew his stack and falsified the to make experiments. Them. Contract killers, if necessary. Right. No he found basically the means whereby you can totally reprogram a human mind at will and change its structure, its intent, its uh, the memory patterns and memory functions, commands being built in to control that individual so they were no longer a free agent, even though they might be under the impression they were. Certain uh, command methods could be used to have that pre-programmed person on command do something which had already been programmed into them by the CIA, NSA, or whoever was using these techniques. This was all part of the mind control programs of the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And this stemmed from basically German work and uh, from some Japanese work, because the Japanese work comes into the picture later in the 70s onward using RF techniques, microwave, and satellites. But this required a great deal more research in between after the beginning programs of the 40s and the 50s. Wilhelm Reich threatened to expose the whole business to the public, and he was then hauled into, they attempted to haul him to court once in 1954. He refused to show when he got away with it. He sent a letter to the judge. But he was uh, inherently unhappy with what he had been used for and said he would never work for the CIA again. In fact, all of his lab personnel were armed to the teeth to keep out in one particular government agency, and that was the FDA. If any FDA personnel ever showed up on any of his lab property, he orders where to shoot first and ask questions afterwards. Other government agencies he cooperated with. Uh, it was very interesting for me, uh, the connection that you were discussing yesterday between some certain uh, indoctrination techniques by um, Indian yogi cults, uh, that were later introduced into the CIA, indoctrination techniques that involved some specialized sexual practices. Oh, this had nothing to do with yoga practices. This was a direct offshoot from the Wilhelm Reich techniques and Wilhelm Reich's research. Basically, uh, we'll not go into the whole nine yards of it on camera, but basically what Reich discovered in that five-year period, 47 to 52, was that there was a great relationship between the mental functioning of the human and sex and the orgiastic state, as he called it, and that he found that in the orgiastic state, if you could hold that point where the person was about ready to have an orgasm but not have the orgasm, you were held at a peak point of nervous excitation. At that point, the human subconscious and the human conscious locked together in an open line and everything that's in the subconscious becomes available to the conscious mind. The soul connects to the mind. Right. Therefore, you can reprogram that person if you know what you're doing, and Reich found out partially how it could be done, and the CIA, after many years of work, 
and the NSA found out how you could complete this so that a person could be programmed with certain inbuilt mechanisms, functions, memories, change memories, whatever. And uh, while the initial techniques were more physical, after uh, some time in the 70s, they developed uh, purely electronic techniques which would induce the orgiastic state and hold it Electronic. electronically. Right. And these pieces of equipment are in every hospital in the United States which accepts federal funding by law. It requires a double floppy disk in the computer. One is a standard floppy because they use these equipments normally for um, EEG measurement or shock therapy if they need to use shock therapy in the psychiatric wards. But with the induction of a special second floppy which goes into a portion which is normally locked this is the so-called uh, orgiastic floppy, which the induces drive. right, which induces that state in the person who is wired up to this equipment, which now is not with big pads but with very tiny little probes, which are 50 millimeters square. And in the certain appropriate points of the body, they are attached. I won't go into all of them, but all over the body in very critical nerve ganglia points. That person is pushed and thrown, in, if you will, into the orgiastic state, and then by computer, they can change that person's mind, memory, programming, whatever. And when they're done, <coughs> shut it off and install a final command that they don't remember anything that's happened. And then, of course, the person is released. <coughs> no drugs, no messy uh, techniques of the early Arachian form, and they can be done to an, a patient uh, whether it's a regular patient or an in-out patient at any institution in the U.S. that has its equipment. Private hospitals are not accepting federal funding, do not have the law requirement to carry such equipment, but it is recommended that they do. But every major hospital that has federal funding has required the law to have at least one of these machines there, and they're usually kept under tight lock and key. This is how far some of the programming techniques have gone in this country, and this is only one example. A friend of mine who works in one of the hospitals upstate New York has personally seen the equipment. And uh, he didn't say he'd seen it in operation, but I think probably he has. And he knows exactly how it works and exactly what is done to make it function. And that it can be used for those purposes. This took many years of research after Wilhelm Reich. And of course Reich died in 1957 in prison. He had to refuse to reveal what classified government work he was working on in early 57. And the judge said his hands were tied. He had no choice but to commit him to prison unless he could show good cause why he should not. Which meant he had to talk about his classified work, and he says, I can't. So he went to prison and died there. And, of course, came the famous FDA book burning of Wilhelm Reich's works. They went around and literally confiscated thousands of Reich books, and in a particularly vicious form of Nazi book burning, went ahead and burned the books. These have been republished since most of them. I think there are a few that are still out of print and held privately. They didn't get all of them, of course, but they got them in the bookstores and the places where they were normally purchased. So this was an Orwellian blacklisting? It was a and form of Orwellian blacklisting. From the libraries and from the academic memory of this society. Right. He was showing in all of his published works, which was not only his journals, his journal of organomy, but all of the various uh, magazines, the books he had written and published, which were many, about a dozen. He was showing the function of orgone energy, not only in terms of the human body, but in terms of the atmosphere, weather, weather, weather control, smog, the relationships of smog and smoggy uh, conditions in the Earth's atmosphere, how it was related to the loss of orgone energy in the atmosphere, and so forth. President's tape is about secret weather control in yes. relation by Oregon energy that's, to that's very true. balloon sounds. Well, radio sounds, as they call them. Yeah. And these radio sounds, believe it or not, were designed initially and built in uh, breadboard form by Wilhelm Reich in his laboratory in Rangeley, Maine. And they were shipped down to a neat little laboratory in Long Island called Brookhaven. And there they were beaten into a production form and found out how they could produce them th by the thousand fairly inexpensively, and they did. You know, Preston bought up nearly the entire stock in the United States, surplus, because they were banned after a certain point of time of being used, and the government didn't want the secret out that they were modifying the weather, not measuring it, because ground-receiving stations were not built. 
Well, the bulb was the transmitter. So what do you do with the transmitter if you have no receiver? Well, you're doing something else. And they were. They were modifying the weather on an experimental basis. And the bigger units were capable of steering hurricanes. Now, the AMT-6 started out with a little box, an AMT-2, then a slightly larger one with a white plastic uh, bubble on the top, shaped uh, with a point and then with a, a round section. And uh, this uh, AMT-4 was a little more powerful. And you uh, used that as a, a more advanced form of weather control. This is one of the earlier models. This was the earliest model, the AMT-2, which comprised of this white portion. It had the same antenna in it. It was run by a battery pack. And uh, the rest of it was a different kind of a box structure, which contained some elements, namely <coughs> two sensing, uh, three sensing elements. One was barometric pressure. The other was... Uh, a special strip which actually sensed the amount of organ energy in the atmosphere and converted it to an electrical signal. The other one sensed the amount of door energy, which is considered disintegrant organ energy in the atmosphere, sensed that and gave it an electrical equivalent, and then went through a special modulator chopper system and it was fed out in the transmitter, that being that small unit being one of the first ones, rather low power which would then modify the weather experimentally in a limited area. They went from smaller to bigger boxes and finally to the big AMT-6, which in its final form, which you can hardly find anymore, was in a cylindrical tube that stood about this high off the floor, about that diameter, and had a huge antenna that stuck out of the bottom about that long. And the antenna was deployed after it was in flight, so to speak. The large ones were taken up in a plane and dropped off a parachute. The smaller units went up in a balloon. So basically this is a manipulation of the micro and of the macro, from the mind to the weather. Yes. Uh, but to summarize here, so basically the Germans this developed mind control through uh, chemotherapy and hypnosis. And Correct. And they used very heavily scopolamine and other chemicals, but scopolamine was their principal weapon for hypnosis and mind bending, if you will. And it was, it was used very effectively and with hypnosis to change a mind and do a, a programming under chemical means. And later on, because not only the rocket scientists got, German rocket scientists got shared by the Allied powers after the Second World War, but so were all other secret scientists, so were their uh, SS uh, specialists, uh, Gestapo, uh, tutors, the propaganda ministry, especially that was shared by the Allied powers, and obviously all these mind control experiments were moved uh, and continued in the other countries. Here in the United States, I've read a lot of books about parapsychology development in, in, in the Soviet Union. In Russia, of course, the, the other goes wrong. Always one would read about such uh, advanced technologies developed in the United States, but obviously they were developed everywhere. In all and, the major countries. Yeah. And so here, on top of the uh, chemotherapy and hypnosis, obviously in, in the United States were developed uh, the other two methods, namely with implanted microchips and with uh, some microwave radiation. Yes. The earlier form of electrical stimulation using uh, orgon Reichian techniques was one. Then they came to another technique under the more advanced mind control techniques in which uh, that was discovered by Preston Nichols sometime in the 80s. He found out about the other technique they were using, which was used and implemented at uh, Montauk, the Phoenix Project. It consisted of a more or less standard low-powered radio transmitter. He replicated the whole system as an experimental test. He took a 250-watt surplus uh, radio transmitter operating at a uh, high-frequency range, which says between 3 and 30 megahertz, designed a special modulator for it, and then had a tape recorder, uh, which had a tape recorded on it, which said, in essence, uh, quote, anyone hearing this message will call such and such phone number. And that phone number happened to be a Long Island phone number in the home of a friend of Preston's. He didn't use his number. Now, the, the criteria of this thing was none of the victims were 
to have and did have a radio receiver. What they were doing was broadcasting second-order energy, which the human mind picks up and decodes directly, as if it had a radio receiver. The human mind does have a radio receiver operating at second-order frequencies. Telepathic receiver, basically. And basically a telepathic type of receiver. And you can uh, make it work just as well with an RF transmitter, a radio transmitter, if you know how to do the proper modulation on it, because what you're doing with a tube-type transmitter is you're already emitting not only ordinary electromagnetic waves, which is first order, but second, third, fourth order. And, and it there's not go through the vacuum tube, but do not go through solid-state <coughs> electronics. Correct. And what they did was turn this thing on and let it run for maybe eight hours a day for about three days. He wanted to find out, Preston that is, wanted to find out if this technique was valid, i.e. would people hear it in their heads. Now they did. They had a tape recorder, an automatic answering machine tied to his friend's phone number for about three days. They received over 600 phone calls from all parts of the eastern seaboard of the United States and as far away as Florida. When they finally went through them all, they found that there was actually only about 200 separate individuals. Some of them called several times because this message was on the air three, for about three days. It stopped then because of the fact that somebody in the government found out what they were doing, located the transmitter, which is no problem for the FCC, with all of their portable vans, and uh, hold off the transmitter. Next thing that happens, the tapes are recorded and the telephone system disappeared. And then sometime after that, the gentleman who let his home be used for this little experiment disappeared himself. But he proved the point. You can program a person and condition them in such a manner that from a specialized radio transmitter they can receive a signal directly without having to carry a little box around in their pocket. The only box they need is a working brain up here that will pick up the signal and decode it. And if they're already preconditioned, this is the key, they must be preconditioned by whatever programming is put into them. If they're preconditioned to hear this signal, because you see, everybody can call in, only people have been preconditioned. They hear the signal, they go for the phone, they call whatever number they're supposed to call, and then what can happen from that point is, this did not happen in this case, but what can happen is that some respondent, whether it be a machine or a person on the other end, will provide a secondary trigger, which will then trigger the whole program, which this person has buried in them. And then they become the robot, the automaton, uh, whatever, to do whatever they're doing, like mass, mass killers, mass that killers, schoolyards, schoolyards or cafeterias, or in the tops of the Belfry uh, Tower at uh, UFC Berkeley, which is a famous case there, where this guy went up there, gunman went up there with a rifle and shot about 15 people. So it's your opinion that it was an experiment? It could have been such an experiment. That's so could well have been. And you have the famous case of Sirhan Sirhan uh, killing Jack Kennedy. He shot wildly. He uh, hit Kennedy with one bullet, but it was proven forensically that the bullet that killed Kennedy never came from Sirhan Sirhan's gun. It came from somebody behind Kennedy, firing from less than three inches from him behind his right ear. And that man was, of course, one of the guards. who was a substitute that day for the regular guard. They planned these very carefully. But then they have to have a patsy. So Sir Hans Sirhan was a patsy. He was accused, he was tried, and he was convicted and went off to prison. He, he probably never uh, did any severe damage to him at all. Then you have, of course, the even more famous case of Robert Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, I'm sorry, where they said a single gunman, single bullet theory, which has been so thoroughly exploded in recent years. There were at least three assassins, and some of the films show it and some of the private photos show it. And of course, poor little Mr. Oswald, ex-CIA agent, was the patsy and they sacrificed him, properly set up to call him the gunman. And if that wasn't enough, of course, in the basement of the police station in Dallas, and Mr. Jack Ruby runs forward and pulls the trigger and shoots Mr. Oswald on national television. Uh, he didn't die then either, by the way. He died on the operating table later. They made sure he was dead before he left the operating table. And he said himself, that is Oswald, I didn't kill anybody. He never pulled the trigger. He wasn't even on the fifth floor. And that shows very clearly in the movies. These kind of mind manipulation techniques are everywhere. The problem was you don't know who is pulling them or what they intend to do with them or how far they intend to go. Uh, what would you comment on 
the implantation of microchips into the human brain for the purposes of uh, listening to the sounds around the person, maybe even getting visual signal from what the person sees, to from one point on uh, turning the big master switch and assuming control over that being and actually commanding it what to do. Uh, in last one of last year's issues of uh, the Mutual UFO Network Journal, the MUFON UFO Journal, there was a very good article uh, of about maybe two dozen papers in uh, official academic medical journals about implantation of microchips into pets and human beings, into human brains, for the purpose of uh, mind control. Some of these papers were from the early 60s, uh, which means that more than 30 years of such research has been going on. This is a topic very important in the field of ufology with all this uh, mind implantation by the little grays going on and it has been my suspicion all along that many of these techniques have been in the arsenal of the government and so one should look first of all into his own government and then into some aliens doing uh, this massive implantation the rumors are that from one in 40 all the way up to one in 10 from the united states uh, population have been implanted well, if you go into the history of this type of mind control by signal, by external control, you can go back as early as 1960 when uh, Dr. Delgado was experimenting with implanted chips in the heads of uh, bulls, and he proved in the ring in Spain, I think Barcelona, that uh, a charging bull could be stopped in its tracks by flipping a switch on a little electric, uh, electronic control box and a radio transmitter, which affected this chip buried in the bull's head. The similar bull, like a radio control model. Similar to a radio control model, except he was doing a very simple signal transmission, which caused the bull to turn aside and was and set up in some manner, which made a very effective control of the bull. He lost his anger, or he was just directed to turn aside. That was publicly demonstrated. Now, that was only the beginning. Nobody has been able to find out exactly what Delgado did since then, but of course, you have the spectacle of the CIA continuing, and as microchips were produced, you have had implants which have been found in people's heads by the proper uh, high-definition radar, not radar, but X-ray systems, and also the uh, <coughs> MRW systems, or MNR. They can also find these chips. But you have more than one class. The initial class was probably developed by our government, possibly in conjunction with alien technology and possibly strictly on our own. But then you have certain documentary films which the Japanese have produced showing uh, after interview of people and putting them through CAT scans, they can show implanted devices directly in the brain. They cannot figure out how they got there and they know damn blessed it well, they can never remove them because it would kill the person to try and take these things out of the brain. And they cannot explain how they got there. They cannot uh, understand the technology involved because it's not terrestrial technology. It's one of the proofs about UFOs and ETs. Some of these implanted devices there's defy any medical skill we have to put in the head where they are. Maybe they were beamed inside, beamed down. It's hard to say how it was. It's hard to say how it might have been done. But they're there. They're easily visible in a layer-by-layer -layer CAT scan into what part of the brains are in, and very often they find two of them, one on the left lobe, one on the right lobe. Now, what effect they have is unknown because it's not been detected in some of these cases that the individuals had uh, particularly erratic behavior. But the technology is there, the technique is there, and where the line ends between U.S. government uh, hardware and control and alien technology and control is very hard to say. But this is... They all work. The evidence is they're working together. They're working Basically together. One for the other. Exactly. Going to the Phoenix Project, one of the aspects there, of course, was mentioned the radio device, radio transmitter for human people 
brains properly set up will pick up the signal and respond. You have other types of technology which have been developed as a result of the continuing work at Phoenix, at Montauk, elsewhere. Because you must also know that there were 25 stations. Every SAGE station was converted essentially to a Montauk type operation, though they didn't all stay online. Eventually only about three left. And how many other projects buried elsewhere were going on? We don't really know. We know of two. ITT Corporation, who was the contractor for all of the hardware for Montauk, that is for the Phoenix Project at Montauk, also had some ongoing side projects. At Brentwood, uh, Long Island, existed for many years, actually some, since sometime after the turn of the century, a overseas communication system known as McKay Radio Overseas Communications. About 1966, the system was bought out by ITT. It was a huge... Tesla, no noise communication? No. No, it was standard, ordinary communication using regular transmitters. Only they had a bank of about 52 transmitters there for different frequencies that were set up for continuing overseas communication, which was voice, which was teletype, which was fax, and uh, everything imaginable, both black and white and color fax. The transmitter site was at Brentwood, and after it was shut down, which was in the fall of 86 when I was there on the island, we went through there and found uh, they had been experimenting on other projects on the side, and some of the transmitters had some non-standard equipment in them. We found other non-standard equipment around, and we finally located the chief engineer of the site, who admitted that there were major changes in the installation, which he had no understanding of what they were for. They had the regular traffic, and they had direct tie inlands to ITT laboratories at Nutley, New Jersey, through dedicated phone lines direct to that site for inputs that he had no idea what they were. He said it was totally controlled from ITT Nutley. It could have been for some special communications, not to Europe, but probably to outer space, to the moon bases. Could well, uh, could well have been. Now, they had a parallel project going on with certain other aspects, which the transmitter site had to have a receiving site. Now, the receiving site was not in the same location. They moved it about 30 miles away to Southampton, Long Island, and there they had the gigantic receiver site, which is still essentially there. The uh, transmitter site was demolished and um, converted into a um, industrial park, which is all you see now as an industrial park from about 87 onward. But in that site, some strange things went on, and the story of how this project came down is even stranger. Might be worth noting. We had to track back, and Preston Nichols was very heavy in this because he's a radio amateur and he's in the radio amateur clubs. And he had been by that place many times, and one October night with... He, Duncan, and myself in his van headed up to the place. He wanted to show me this vast transmitter site. He says, I don't think we can get on in there, but it's there. Well, the gates were wide open. The guards were gone. The power was off. So we drove in and drove around and wandered all through the place. And they had not yet started demolishing the main transmitter building. They had demolished some of the smaller buildings peripherally, which may have had some manufacturing facilities. We're not sure. But we went through that, saw all of the transmitters, and there were some very strange charges left on them. Eventually, of course, the amateurs were invited in to strip the place, take anything they wanted, because it would save the contractor the trouble of removing it. So the amateurs had a field day. They took down five towers, 120 feet high, with the rotating antennas. They saved the antennas. They took everything you can imagine. And when they were done, they still had literally dozens, tens of tons of hardware to scrap. The transmitters eventually were bulldozed, what was left of them. But we couldn't understand why this place shut down, because it was a functioning overseas communication system. Well, finally, the story filtered through from uh, ITT Corporation's headquarters at uh, Maiden Lane, New York, about a very strange occurrence in one night in September, actually a Saturday. ITT had planned to shut this facility down on a permanent basis because they really had a little more use for it. And that particular morning on a Saturday, they gave instructions by phone to the uh, station master that this was to be the last day of transmission. There would be some traffic that would come through, and they would have shut down and secure the transmitter on a permanent basis. So he received his orders, 
and throughout the rest of the day and far into the night the transmitter remained on and uh, it was receiving traffic and nobody at uh, the Nutley end or New York could figure out what was going on. They had orders to shut down the station and it was not shut down. It was accepting traffic and transmitting. So they sent somebody out from New York to investigate and he arrived that night and started to go on base, took one look and said, I ain't going on this place. The transmitter building, with all of the transmitters, which was a quite a large structure, was glowing with a blue glow over it, something which was totally abnormal. He wouldn't walk on the base. Uh, the whole, it was surrounded with gates and fences and all of this. He wouldn't go on the base at all, and he went to a telephone and called uh, Nutley and said, there's something very strange going on here. I refuse to set foot on base because of this very weird blue glow, and it just doesn't seem... Uh, normal at all. And attempts from Nutley to contact any of the personnel on the base in the latter part of the afternoon and the early evening were futile. They got no answers on the phone. So they said, okay, don't go on base. We'll come by with the crew in the morning and we'll shut down the power from the substation outside the, the uh, operating area, which they did. And then they went on base. Nothing wrong. Everything appearing perfectly normal. All the equipment was there. Twelve people on that base earlier in the day had vanished completely and were never found. Not a trace. They finally had to tell the families that these people had disappeared. How they handled it, I don't know. But about three days later, they fired up the equipment to see if there's anything wrong with it. They found nothing wrong with it, whatever. Everything, piece of equipment on that base operated properly. But nobody was there. So ITT shut it down and did a little head scratching and finally says, okay, we don't have anything more to do with this place. Get rid of it. So that was when the order came to sell it. They found somebody who was a developer of industrial properties and they bought it lock, stock, and barrel for five million cash. They finally found out how much they paid for it. And ITT told him, you get everything. He says, we don't want all this transmitting gear. He says, you got it all. We don't want it. It's your problem. <laughs> so that's when came the famous offer to the radio amateurs to come in and have at it and take anything they wanted. And they did for two weeks or three weeks. And then, of course, eventually everything was torn up and the transmitters were destroyed, the buildings were leveled. I was there when they were doing it. And the underground facilities, and there were some extensive underground rooms. Uh, they were so strong that they supported the bulldozers without bending at all. What they did with that, I don't know. But they eventually cleared everything and it's now a large uh, industrial site. And there's no trace of the old uh, transmitter uh, towers, the buildings, or the site. But that story was weird in that whatever was going on at that station, apparently the station or something connected with it wasn't about to be shut down. So into the blue went about 12 people, somewhat reminiscent of what happened at Montauk not too long before, except there was a different phenomenon. But that's some of the strange things that have turned up in Long Island in the process. This reminds me of these uh, additional byproducts of the Philadelphia technology way back in the 40s when seamen were disappearing off the deck of the Eldridge and then somebody else appeared, another seaman uh, appeared in, in Italy, buried in a brick wall. Then the, that uh, barroom fight with yes. the human that came out of nowhere. Yeah, you know, those are all interesting stories. The one about the barroom fight is documented. I do have the newspaper clipping finally, which documents a group of sailors coming out of, as they put it in the paper, the rear room of the barroom, fighting and engaging in a, grawl, a brawl and involved themselves with the customers in the bar and bar stools were overturned and things were damaged and they estimated $600 worth of damage, which was quite a lot of damage in 1943. And the MPs and the SPs were called, and the police, and the shore patrol hold off the sailors, and uh, the Navy said they would repair, uh, pay for the damage that was done. The only problem with the story was there was no back room in the bar. There was nothing but a wall. And it would appear that these sailors came out of the wall, probably connected with the Philadelphia experiment. And we don't really know, as has never been run down for the ultimate answer as to where they came from. The other story I've heard once, and I've not been able to get any data on it, is that about the same time a sailor, an American one, turned up buried in a brick wall someplace in Italy. Uh, quite dead when discovered, but the body was half buried in the brick itself. And this was very reminiscent of what happened on the Eldridge. 
where four bodies were buried in the steel, two horizontally in the deck and two vertically in the bulkhead walls. So the phenomenon that was created by the Philadelphia experiment in the final test was enormous. It was very far-reaching and was very, very destructive of many things. And we perhaps do not yet know the full story of what it really did. But we do know that the Navy, of course, wouldn't leave it alone. Eventually had to pick it up again in 47, which I've already outlined. I but remember these... a story here, a very interesting story that I heard on American radio, American forces radio in uh, Japan in uh, the late 70s about a big rock that was a program on unexplained phenomena, Fortean phenomena. One night, a big rock, huge boulder appeared out of nowhere in the middle of the city square of a American city on the East Coast. Next morning, the, all the city elders gathered. The, big, the rock was so big, they couldn't haul it in any truck. They had to cut it in pieces or to dynamite it. Scientists were called in, and one of them said, well, maybe this is a materialization of some material out of a different dimension. And I said, nah, different dimension, my left foot. That was almost 20 years ago, and I have absolutely no idea about time travel, about different parallel dimensions and so on. Phenomena. Yeah, yeah, the 14 phenomena were absolute taboo in Eastern Europe uh, and still are widely unknown. But the program ended with the words, and the name of this scientist was Albert Einstein, and I clearly remember to this day uh, cold ants crawling down my back because I realized that there may be something more serious to this rather than just a simple joke. Uh, then I remember another story in a science fiction uh, magazine. My, my personal feeling is that many of the science fiction stories that we read, and even many of the tabloid reports that we read, and, and that the supermarket checkout lines are daily bombarded with these messages, uh, I'm subscribed to most of the tabloid papers, and the weekly world news is my favorite one. Uh, my feeling is that this is a very subtle way of manipulation and uh, of education of of the whole society by it works on a principle similar to the um, immunization of an organism with uh, a weakened uh, poison or a weakened disease so that the organism can develop its an antibodies in this case the lowest strata of society that doesn't read anything else but tabloid papers serve as this sacrificial lamb that is exposed to the uh, dangerous threatening information and through many years of such bombardment they fi finally learn to live with uh, UFOs vis visiting us every day or the government manipulating space, manipulating time, manipulating the ge genetic code, creating hybrids between humans and animals, between humans and aliens, but and in many ways the uh, science fiction literature has been serving the same purpose. There are so many stories that are written after a carefully orchestrated or designer leak, as I call them sometimes, uh, happens and some intelligence official contacts his friend who is, happens to be a writer and a nice best-selling story or short story or novel appears on the book um, on the market after some time. Uh, so in this uh, science fiction story, uh, two British constables discovered one night a talking head that was appearing protruding out of the pavement and smiling and talking to them. And little by little, more and more human parts and whole and half bodies and whole bodies appeared out of uh, the pavement, out of bricks, out of walls, out of ceilings, out of everywhere. Uh, so this is a very interesting attempt to acquaint the public with the possibility that it is possible to walk through walls, that it is not that difficult and dangerous. And obviously these are signs that secret programs have been going on behind the scenes. Uh, for me, every story that I read in the tabloid papers is an indication that some, some research of that type is going on somewhere behind the scenes and somebody is interested in educating the whole society so that 20 or 50 years later, when this research would be 
put out in the open, in public, uh, in the academia, uh, there wouldn't be a massive panic or suicides. Uh, what other byproducts, um, I mean, negative uh, byproducts of, of the Philadelphia experiment would you uh, comment upon? Or maybe some of these first nuclear tests that we were talking today that had some very interesting uh, starry effects. Well, we can go into the nuclear test program, but first I would point out the phenomena which has been uh, discussed and described is certainly not new to this century. Charles Fort, who was an ordinary newspaper reporter a century and a half ago in England, would start uh, investigating some of these strange occurrences and reports he heard, and of course, like most other people at the time, was very skeptical, but started clipping these newspaper files, and he wound up with some 50 or 100 shoeboxes full of clippings, which wound up being the, eventually the property of the 14 Society. He wrote a series of books, uh, Low uh, Land of the Damned and a few others, in which he concluded that basically we might be the property of somebody else. But he documented so many of these strange occurrences like frogs falling out of the heaven, fish falling out of the heavens on the ground, and uh, other strange falls, even uh, parts, of, parts of bathrooms, of sinks, and what have you, angel hair, animals, just coming out of nowhere. Uh, there has to be an explanation, but none could be found at that time, and the scientists, of course, ignored it. These things have been going on through quite a period of time, and they're not new to us. But this sort of thing continues, and we have the barroom brawls, which may have been induced by hardware that we controlled. Who knows what caused these other phenomena 100 years ago. But when we came on to the era of the nuclear energy, where we dropped the bombs in Japan, we had uh, atomic tests in the Pacific in 1946 and 47, which were essentially ordinary atomic bombs. I use that term ordinary advisedly because it kept growing in size and power. But in 1952, with Edward Teller having created it, they were ready to test the first hydrogen bomb. And in 1954, they tested a second one. And when I remember, if my dates are correct, it was the second test they had an enormous problem with. They decided they wanted a three mile long tunnel to instrument the rate of propagation of the explosion. And it was very carefully instrumented with very precise equipment because EG and G instruments all of these tests, has from the year one and still is to this day. No one else will or can because they control all the patents. But in any case, all of this very nice equipment was built and measurement equipment and time zero uh, markers and so forth and high speed cameras. So they detonated the device and as the Photos from Life magazine showed, and some of the movie films they showed, a mushroom started to form at the island where the device was in a building, and then all of a sudden it was full-blown, full-size, and covered more than the island. The measurements down the tunnels they expected would take about 18 microseconds for propagation if uh, C was a, is the maximum speed of travel of light or anything in this universe, according to Einstein's theory. Well, the bomb went off, and it was T equals zero everywhere, as there was no propagation rate. It was instantaneous to the end of the three-mile tunnels while they lasted. And uh, this threw all of the physicists into a tizzy. They so literally threw out the physics books and says, well, we're back to square one. We start over. And none of the physics we know works or means anything anymore. And, of course, one of the other aspects was life somehow got a hold of the photos. And as the huge... Uh, not mushroom cloud, but hemispherical glowing sphere of light with strange uh, patterns in it started to rise and thin. The aerial cameras, which are photographing this whole thing, caught some very strange phenomena. You can see from the uh, camera and from the pictures which were published by Life that you were looking through the fireball into what was apparently another universe. They were seeing stars. I never forgot that when I saw that in the published issue of Life, and I found out later from channels Life was almost put out of business over that. They were very severely reprimanded. For, however, they didn't even know how they got a hold of the photos, but they did, and they published, which I think the public has a right to know. But 
the military didn't feel the same way about it, particularly the AEC. Right. Who cares about the public seems to be the attitude. They never detonated another hydrogen bomb. That's a simple reason. This was the last one? 54 was the last one. They scheduled one for 56, but it was never uh, detonated. They canceled it because it was to be an underwater test, and they decided, in view of what happened with the 54 test, where not only did they lose the three-mile tunnels, but the entire island was vaporized, and it went down and burning and boiling down to bedrock, and it was burning and boiling in bedrock for three days afterwards until the ocean water finally damped it out. So basically they started kind of a chain they reaction They the started rock. started a chain reaction in the rock, which certain scientists had so warned. And other scientists said, oh, poo-poo, this can't possibly happen. And uh, those who poo-pooed it, of course, were those who ran the tests, and they were performed, and they found out it can happen. And they were afraid that the second explosion may ignite the very water of the ocean. They were, the planet. they were afraid of this for the simple reason that H2O is the most common um, substance on Earth, the most common compound, and it's everywhere. And if somehow they were managed to start a chain reaction in the water itself, it would go through the entire oceans everywhere, and that would be essentially the end of the Earth. They did not, fortunately, set off such a reaction, whether it's damped by minerals or whatever else, I don't know, but... They were fortunate in that that did not happen. So all further tests were abandoned. And then, of course, the Russians start their H-bomb tests. And because the Americans didn't give them the data, they had to repeat everything again. Exactly. So they had their one and only test, which I believe was about 1959. And they expected, according to the reports which came even from Khrushchev later, about a 30 megaton yield. They got a little bit more something they would never admit how much, but it was in excess of 100 megatons. And the Russians said they would never set off another hydrogen bomb again, because it was totally out of control, so far as they were concerned. Their mathematical models, their predictions, their so-called nuclear theory was uh, a pile of garbage. They don't really know what's going on, and I know personally a nuclear physicist. He's published 125 papers. I used to teach at USC Berkeley who said the same thing. He says the nuclear scientists have no idea what's going on. They don't know what's going on with nuclear processes, period. And this from a nuclear physicist. This is the famous explosion uh, on an island in the sea north of Siberia, in basically the northern ocean. Uh, that was so powerful that it broke the needles on the seismographs, not only in Russia, but in many other countries. The earthquake created, but it was so powerful. Well, that one I did not hear of. I most certainly don't hear of everything, and that's why it's necessary for people to get together and compare notes and do networking. Today, the networking via computers is what's uh, getting information around faster than it can be stopped, because you cannot stop the network if the computers are on. It's nationwide, and all of the little computer bulletin boards, which are maintained privately. And this kind of information does get out. Back in the 50s, there were no computers and computer networks. It had to be verbal. Talking but about nuclear bombs, I was very interested when you mentioned that there are persistent rumors and even uh, comments by some major physicists, Oppenheimer included, that uh, the two devices that were exploded over Japan were actually of German uh, origin of German production. This was alluded to by a German who was writing or connected with the book that was published in Toronto, Canada, outlining the history of the UFO development in Germany, and also making some passing reference to the nuclear program which Germany had ongoing during World War II. And it was known, it was found out after the war was over, it was known that the Germans had developed and had built a number of atomic bombs which were in their arsenal and apparently never used. And they were working on a super bomb of a totally unknown design, which they were going to plan to use on New York or London, probably New York, London, or New York, whichever they chose to wipe out first, which according to the reports, a single bomb about the size of a pineapple was sufficient to wipe out the entire city which is to say it was more powerful than the hydrogen bombs which were yet to be invented. 
But this would easily be a, an anti-matter bomb. Very possibly. That's about the only thing that would do it. The German technology was so far advanced beyond ours, it's unbelievable, and it's unbelievable that they lost the war. But they did. And perhaps uh, better for all of us that that did happen. But their technology was very advanced, and they were into these areas. Now, the reports were that, and this was allegedly admitted by Oppenheimer after the war was over, that the two bombs we dropped in Japan and Hiroshima and Nagasaki we did not build. Because we had an extreme shortage of plutonium. There was not enough plutonium to cover the head of a pin in May of 1945, and uh, which was when <coughs> uh, Germany surrendered. It was May of 45? Yes. May, May, May 45. And uh, by the time we came around to dropping the bomb in 46, there was a lot of time in between. No, for actually 45, August 45. It was August 45, okay. There was a few months in between, and it was in that interim period that we suddenly were able to develop a bomb which was dropped, or actually not dropped, but tested at Trinity, New Mexico, allegedly the first nuclear device we had built. And within a few weeks after that, we dropped two bombs on Japan. The question is quite uh, well asked. If we were so short of nuclear materials, they had enough uranium-235 to build bombs, but those were the huge devices like uh, Fat Man or Fat Boy, as they called it, which required a gun barrel to bring the two charges of parts together. A howitzer barrel. A howitzer-type barrel, especially made by the Navy. And uh, it was not a particularly high-yield device. It was rather sloppy, but at least it proved the principle. The question is, did we carry something like that over Japan, or did they drop one of those? And it was later claimed the Nagasaki bomb was actually a plutonium bomb. I can't prove it at this point. But I do know there were enough records at Los Alamos, where I was at the end of the war, to show that the Germans had developed quite a few nuclear devices. And that was not unknown up there at that time. What is your explanation of why Hitler didn't use these devices at the end of the war? I would say there is no good explanation unless you were to totally modify your view of what Hitler's real character was, his real na nature of the person. He has been painted, of course, by many news media, continuing to this day, of course, as being a monster, a person without any feeling or heart. He was out to conquer the world. All of the records today show he was not out to conquer the world, and there's the actual military aspects of the weapons development in Germany were very peculiar. They would not release a weapon into general use in the German military until they had already produced a countermeasures weapon. There was no counter weapon, uh, countermeasures of any type to an atomic bomb. Not at least they were known at that time or now. That is, after the bomb is triggered and set off, there is no countermeasures. The only countermeasure is that you don't set it off. It may have been for that reason that Hitler refused to use it. That's just a speculation, of course, at this point. If he had it and he was losing the war, why didn't he use it as a military weapon? He many times ignored the advice of his own military high staff because he got into the area of the Aryan racial considerations, the racial superiority, and when uh, the British were on the beach at Dunkirk waiting to be evacuated back to England, after they were driven into the sea, the German High Command wanted to kill all of the British, because after all, there were soldiers, and there was a war on, and there's about half a million, and there were prime targets, and legitimate targets in terms of war, to be eliminated, as you would eliminate any army in the field. Hitler interceded and says no. You will not attack them. You will let them escape. They're Aryans. You don't kill Aryans. That was his thinking at the time. The British survived, of course, and some Australians and others with them. And the end result, of course, they lived to come back to Europe another day, which, of course, did happen. But he had some very peculiar philosophies, and one among them was he did not want to wipe out unnecessarily a lot of Aryans, which he considered the British as being. So one has to take a little look, no matter how difficult it may be, at some of Hitler's philosophy and find out where his head was really at, because you will not get a true picture from the current propaganda or the ongoing propaganda from the end of World War II, 
or during World War II. Much of the propaganda that was against Hitler from our side after we were in the war, of course, portrayed him as a beast. But remember two things. Hitler never had a bodyguard. He had military around him, but he never carried bodyguards around with him like every president in the United States does, particularly in the last uh, two administrations. And number two, when he went anywhere in Germany, the children all ran up to him. They actually loved him. And children have a way of knowing psychically when somebody is evil. Now, if they didn't shunned him and they ran up to him on a regular basis. You cannot stage manage this all the time. You can stage manage it perhaps a good part of the time. But all of the newsreels are there as testimony. He went all over Germany, sometimes very much alone, without bodyguards, would hike in the mountains alone. If that man was so evil and so hated, why did the German people not attack him? Very similar to the way Russian children would rush to Stalin and shower him with flowers and kisses and hugs. Uh, it's an interesting way of how a totalitarian country can manipulate its population and through propaganda can paint a picture of a person being the father of a nation. True, and he was, in the case of Hitler, he was considered uh, not only the Fuhrer the leader, he was considered in many respects the father of the new nation, the Third Reich and that he had made many promises, and he kept them all. Namely, guns and butter, he would pull the nation out of the poverty it had been in, rebuild the nation, rearm it. He did all of these things. Regardless of how he did them, he did them. And regardless of the concentration camps, the people who were dissidents, he did reunify Germany and, and keep his promises. And he also kept another basic promise, which was the reason why he achieved power in the first place, was he promised to throw all of the... Bolsheviks and all of the communists out of Germany, and he did. They were threatening to take over Germany in 1928-29. There was a very serious movement, a communist movement in Germany at that time before he uh, acceded to full power. He was in a semi-full power from 1930 on, but when the burning of the Reichstag, and he became... Uh, Which actually was ignited by three Bulgarians that were on trial in that, uh, Leipzig for the burning down of the Reichstag. That part I wouldn't but know. But that's another long story. Right. Other than the Bulgarian involvement, as usual, in not only the killing of the Pope and burning of the Reichstag, but in other famous uh, espionage affairs in Europe, mm -hmm. I, I would like you to comment uh, if you have any information about in, uh, particular extraterrestrial race involvement with the Ger involvement with the Germans. I've heard about crash saucers in Penimunde or elsewhere in the Bavarian Alps. Uh, I've heard about some races coming and getting disillusioned and going from Germany. Well, there's a great deal of information, and Billy Myers is a source of quite a bit of it, that the Pleiadians approached uh, Hitler, a specific group of Pleiadians, approached Hitler in 1933-34, and eventually after first approaching the U.S. and being rejected by uh, Roosevelt, they went to Germany, made a deal with Hitler to provide him with technology and uh, help build up the nation. And their price and requirement was that uh, he would take a very easy stand and no rough stuff in handling the Jewish problem, which he said, we know you have. But he says, will be no rough stuff. Now, Hitler in that day readily agreed to it because history shows that in the period up through 1940-41, there was no rough treatment of the Jewish and other dissidents in the concentration camps. In fact, they were treated quite well. And that they, there were plans to repatriate all of them to Madagascar, that island south of... Right, there was that plan, and of course the Madagascarans apparently rejected it. They wanted no part of it. But in any case, there were plans to do this. The National Socialist Party, in the period prior to World War II, did not and could not conceive of a massacre of the Jewish people. They knew it was a problem, they wanted to get rid of them, but they didn't know how to do it, and it was an endless debate. But quite aside from this, the Bladens said they would provide them with technology, and there was the rumor and the story of a crash saucer that came down on the Bavarian Alps in sometime in late 1935, which was a source of a lot of German technology. Now, this story has been repeated many times by people who came from Pienemunde who found the wreckage of a UFO in Germany after the war was over. In the same place in or at Pienemunde? At heard. Pienemunde. So this is the second crash. I don't know if it's the second one or not. 
But they found the parts and pieces for it, and they knew that the Germans had some kind of outside help. Now, from what I understand, the, pain, the operation with the Pleiadans, they provided some personnel also, went ahead, they developed fast new technologies, and they moved very rapidly mm. in developing their own technology and some highly advanced technology, which included circular foil aircraft, which started to show up in the research areas in 1937-38, were actually being built as early as 1939, replicas of the Pleiadian craft, but not with the Pleiadian drive. What I understand, they never did uh, solve the Pleiadian drive system, but developed their own. Victor Schaumberger was well known for his contributions technically to the flying saucer circular foil aircraft, if you will, technology, is known throughout the world for his aircraft designs and the circular foil aircraft designs. Eventually developed a true electromagnetic anti-gravity drive, and this came in the latter part of the war. But this one basically all stems from the Pleiadian uh, giving of technology to Germany and a lot of other ideas. How much was given, we don't really know. But I understand that about 1941, for whatever reason, the Pleiadians pulled out. They would no longer support Hitler. And in its stead came via, the information came via a respected channel that I know of, and I do not mean a uh, metaphysical channel, but a very physical, real channel, an ex-agent of the government, U.S., who knew Germans during the period right after World War II, and they used to tell the stories about how the Greys made a deal with Hitler, a little three-and-a-half-foot grays, allegedly, and gave him technology, and they wanted uh, humans to experiment on. And the stories are that Hitler told them, he says, you can't have any of the Germans, the Aryans, but he says, you can take all the people you want out of the concentration camps. I don't give a hoot about them. And they did. I am told that there was a large discrepancy in count between the records of those who went into the camps those who came out alive, those who were there dead, in which they had uh, skull bones and other evidence of who had died there, there was still a large number unaccounted for. What percentage, I don't know. It may well be that the Greys took some of them out of the camps for their own genetic experimentations under Germany. The second largest area of, of Grey invasion is in Europe. The primary area is in the U.S. But this is another, just another side issue. Uh. I've been thinking about this uh, crash landing of UFOs when uh, an alien nation wants to establish contact with a particular plan planetary race. Uh, it has many uh, functions to it. For example, uh, when a disabled UFO is left in the middle of a field, it is like a huge dead bear being found in the middle of a prim or a dead bees being found in the middle of a primitive village on the morning people are afraid of it but eventually they overcome their fear they start dancing over it and little by little they develop their stories of how to fight these beasts so by my feeling is that these are all engineered crashes and these are old <laughs> surplus ships that are left on the planet for the locals to explore and to slowly get over the fear. If it is a live UFO with live aliens coming out of it, it would be a panic similar to what Orson Welles caused with his dramatization of the War of the Worlds. Another interesting uh, detail here is that uh, many times the aliens conclude a treaty with a government but with the very top echelon less than probably 10 or 20 people in the whole country know that there is a treaty with aliens and that information is being transferred from their civilization to ours. And so crash landing of a UFO is an interesting explanation for the lower echelons of the engineers and the military of this sudden, ex sudden explosion of, of new ideas, new solutions that come literally out of nowhere, as we have all seen, and um, especially I was astonished myself in my research of the last year, uh, starting very skeptically uh, to research the rumors of German UFOs, and only in one year discovering more than 50, 60 different models of, of uh, flying 
craft powered with every possible engine that we know of and some other impossible engines that Germans, the Germans built, especially uh, for the UFOs. Uh, so my point is that uh, such crashes are organized, engineered, so that to explain away this sudden explosion and cornucopia of, 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 of new technologies to, technologies to the rest of the engineering elite without having to reveal to everybody that, oh yes, yeah, we are in contact with aliens. That's a very interesting point because the cover-up that has persisted throughout history, and I'm not talking about uh, modern history in the last 50 or 100 years, but throughout history, <clears throat> all of the researchers have shown whether you quote G. Cope Shellhorn, who is a Ph.D. and a biblical scholar, and has shown that UFOs have existed throughout the ages, going back at least 5,000, maybe 10,000 years, and there's ample evidence of it. There has always been somebody here that's been contacted, and it usually is going to prove to be that it was the kings, the priests, or those of the highest echelons of government. They didn't want the general public to know that they were trafficking with aliens, if you will. And uh, for whatever purpose or reason. Now, in the current era, let us say the last hundred years, you have the same problem. There were aliens around this planet. And in the period of uh, more modern history, which I would say, let us say from the time of the fall of Atlantis, or the destruction of Atlantis, which many people may still dispute, and a lot of scientists want to dispute, but there's more than ample evidence if you know where to dig. Atlantis was apparently destroyed by outside intervention, which produced the cataclysmic earthquakes, which finally sank the last island. But in the process after that, a governing body on Earth was set up, which is uh, now known as, and has been known for centuries and millennia, as the, Illum the Order of the Illuminati. The Illuminati is a strange organization. It has its current world headquarters and has had it for at least 500 years at Basel, Switzerland but from the earlier days was elsewhere, and it went back actually to the days after the collapse of Atlantis. And there's a governing body within it of three people. Two were always humans, and the third was always a reptilian. Which is to say there is an outside influence in the affairs of Earth and has been for at least 10,000 years, a direct influence. And the rest of the orders, apparently, for the progress of humanity to what is to go on here comes would appear from outside. Today, the Order of the Illuminati is not the only secret organization. There are many. We have the not-so-secret, but of course it has the secret aspects to it, the CFR, Council on Foreign Relations. We have the Trilateral Commission. We have the Club of Rome, which is not well known, but a the think tank for the whole operation of the secret societies and groups. And the limitation of the population and all these populations. They have uh, generated the programs, and you have the Bilderbergers, and, and interlocked with all of this, of course, is the Order of the Illuminati. They have been setting policy, along with the so-called elite, the wealthiest people on Earth, for more than a year or two, and more than a hundred years or two. It's been going on for centuries, because the old money of Europe, as they call it, it's not four or five hundred years old, it's perhaps a thousand years old. You have to consider the, the de' Medici's of Italy and some of the other families which are unknown totally to the outside world today, which have trillions of dollars in wealth. As only one example, the Habsburgs of Germany and of Europe have enormous wealth. It's un uncounted. It's in the trillions. They have gold reserves of staggering quantities. It would make uh, Fort Knox look like a toy playpen. At Fort Knox, it doesn't have any gold now anymore, but in any case, when it did have a gold reserve stock, what the Habsburgs already had for centuries in Europe was far greater than anything we've had in this country. I won't go into all the financial details and how I know some of this, but enormous quantities of money, of gold, of wealth have existed. And it's all been maneuvered. It's all been controlled for a purpose. The real break in civilization, you, say, you might say, became obvious in the Industrial Revolution, and when the church's power was broken in 1500 A.D., when you had the Protestants, as they called them, Luther, uh, John Calvin, and all the rest who followed, and the power of the Vatican was largely broken, not totally, but largely broken, and with it 
came the Renaissance and, of course, the development in an open style of the technology which was already known and held in secret. And this has been known for many, many centuries. You have knowledge of alchemy, which is a very advanced form of chemistry, and actually a very advanced form of uh, matter manipulation, which was known to the ancients. Vibrational chemistry. You go back to Atlantis and elsewhere, you probably will find an older form of alchemy, which was very active in those days, in which they transmuted metals and all kinds of substances. That art has been largely lost. It is not lost totally. There are secret schools which still operate teaching alchemy. And you have, of course, now in modern scientific terms, you have the capability with these giant cyclotrons and atom smashers, you can transmute matter on a very small scale. And when it came to the development of the atomic bomb, they had to transmute matter on a large scale. Plutonium is a synthetic element. It does not, it exists in the atomic table, but beyond the 92 elements. And it is artificially created. And they had to create it in large amounts, and they gave them a great deal of trouble. But it's modern alchemy. Are you implying that some of the plutonium from the bombs may have been created by the secret societies through purely alchemical... No, I wasn't, I wasn't applying that. I was merely stating that the conversion of uranium to plutonium mm -hmm. is, in essence, an alchemical process because you are changing one element into another. But very crude. In a crude, but in a scientific manner, but in large amounts. That is, compared to alchemy, you are converting it. We do have the technology today to do this sort of thing. And it's not in the form of the older alchemy, which is a very difficult process to learn, but it is real. But we're not doing it. What else are we doing that the public doesn't know about? This is the problem. You have a two-tier technology. Maybe. You, it may be many tiers. You have had a two-tier technology for two or three hundred years at least. Radio was used earlier than Tesla, who was given the credit for developing it and inventing it in 1893. It was used as early as 1847, if not earlier. In fact, it was used, according to some reports, in the Napoleonic Wars to manipulate the London Stock Exchange. Right. And by other means, uh, to do some very fancy manipulation where the public and even the elite, for the most part, were not told what was going on. Only a few key people knew. These technologies have existed from ancient times and they've been kept well hidden. They were not available to the masses because they didn't have the technological base to build them. These may have been leftover pieces of hardware. They may have been supplied by aliens. They may have been secret laboratories that could produce them by ones and twos. And not only this, but they were made... You have to have special technologies available only to the elite to continue their sense of control, their, their feeling of power. And every time a, a given technology is spread into the, people, into the wider population, you have to present the next new toy for the elite. These higher levels of conspiracies that control the terrestrial elite. They never leave the guys without any new toys. It may be a new Nautilus submarine when everybody travels above surface and nobody even dreams of going underwater. It may be a program to land on, on the moon way back, way before anybody even dreams of going there. You know, it's like the uh, British team exploration of the moon in 1897, 1898. I'm very curious of, of, of what you have heard about this. Well, there is an interesting story that went around. Uh, a friend of mine, Preston Nichols, and I can't talk about it now because he's not only no longer employed, he's blacklisted by the government totally. Uh, when he was still working with his company, AIL, I got into a discussion with him about uh, earlier landings on the moon and Mars, namely the Alternative 3 story in the program. And he says he got discussing this with his boss one day at the company he worked at, AIL, one of the divisions of it on Long Island. And his boss looked at him curiously. He says, you don't really know what's been going on. He says, you don't know anything about the moon explorations of the last century. With an illuminated smile on his face. And, of course, Breston Nichols, who was not usually jogged very much, uh, probably dropped his jaw to the floor at that point because that was one he was not ready for as much as he has been ready for. He says, I couldn't pump anything out of the boss as to what really happened and who did it. But he implied it was just before the turn of the century that this, this actual exploration took place. 
Now we have the stories, also, we know about the Alternative 3 program, but there are also now documentaries which show that the Germans went to the moon and Mars in 1949 with a circular foil aircraft. Probably the rest of the engineering uh, was perfected down in Antarctica because they prepared these bases in Antarctica in 1939 after the two years of exploration and moved there before the war collapsed. How many moved there, I don't know, but there are rumors that there were thousands of German troops moved into Antarctica and the prepared quarters they had. And they continue their manufacturing either down there or in one of the friendly South American countries, such as Argentina, as one example. But they finished the development. They made the circular foil aircrafts. Pictures show them as quite large. Building in, if you can believe this, a 1943 aircraft circular foil designs which were 75 meters in diameter and carried naval guns under the turrets underneath them. If not naval guns, panzer mounted guns from the direct from their tanks. And these are photographs which are clear enough to show that no extraterrestrial vehicle is going to carry naval guns or tank guns of a very normal and recognizable terrestrial design. These were not alien UFOs. These were German-built, terrestrially built, undoubtedly German, because nobody else had the technology. When you see pictures of this, you see documentaries which show that they left and went to Moon and Mars in 49. One has to ask questions, maybe earlier. Where did they manage to complete this technology? Where did it get buried? Where had they been? Where else have they gone beyond the Moon and Mars? And what have they done with this technology? Here. This is the big unknown. And so, uh, this is actually the very reason I've been talking and researching the topic of uh, German UFOs and um, the German secret space programs, because my feeling is that all behind the scenes, uh, the United States and Germany during the war have been control controlled by the very same power center. So, on a one level up, in the conspiratorial hierarchies, two bitter opponents and fighters, usually their uh, corrupt governments, are controlled by the same uh, power source. Uh, during the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union took part in a vast secret space program for exploration of the uh, solar system and beyond, uh, with the uh, flying saucers of the, basically, the reality that we see on t Star Trek. So, uh, it is very interesting to explore how these little conspiratorial levels go up through the hierarchies, uh, leave the material terrestrial domain, and continue through the supermaterial to the non-terrestrial, uh, to the, through the extraterrestrial hierarchies and federations of uh, United Planets, all the way to the highest levels of uh, celestial power structures. Uh, and so, going back in time, 100 years, and discovering that there may have been a secret British space program, and a recent uh, private interview with a Russian academician, from a secret government research institute on anti-gravity basically proves, gives the theoretical uh, explanation of how this could have been done with a hybrid gun, rocket, and anti-gravity technology that the British could easily build at the end of last century. The big question is if the British and later the Germans had that much and could go to the moon and Mars in 50 years ago, what do we have now? And so we naturally come back to the uh, Philadelphia experiment and to the Phoenix project, because uh, in my opinion, the Philadelphia experiment uh, is not only uh, invisibility and time travel, but it's a teleportation. It's a very important teleportation experiment where people can be beep, beamed up and down from a ship to the surface of the planet. And even more, they can be beamed from one planet to another, totally bypassing the rocketry or the saucer technology, and basically putting the Earth on par with uh, some of the more advanced uh, extraterrestrial technologies. Even the Pleiadians 
have to use their craft in order to hop and fly from planet to planet. Uh, and obviously, uh, some of these technologies were used exactly for that, for teleportation between different planets and even for creation of these time tunnels or wormholes, wormhole tentacles that can be attached to other to another planet in our solar system or in a different solar system in our galaxy, basically to any point in our galaxy or to planets in other galaxies, uh, it becomes an interesting celestial <laughs> wormhole subway system that can transfer people and objects and material uh, to any point in the universe. And this was the most uh, astonishing finding for me after our lengthy talks here with Al. So I would be very glad if you can comment a little bit, and that would be actually the preparation for our next day, because I see that we have just six minutes more left. So if you can give a little uh, summary on these aspects of the Phoenix project. All right, the Philadelphia experiment was really the granddaddy experiment that set the stage for everything that came after it, including the Phoenix project. But the peculiar part, of course, was that the Philadelphia experiment would not have created the disaster and also laid the groundwork for what came later if it had not been for the Phoenix project. It's a time loop problem. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? In terms of ordinary time, the Philadelphia experiment. Then came later the Phoenix project. What the Phoenix project in its final phase has really accomplished was the creation of a transportation system in both space and time which is capable of going anywhere in our galaxy, set a person, an object down, or pick a person or an object up, and bring it back to the station, which was the primary one at Montauk. Without a second station. Without a second the station. To be on that planet. No, no receiver. One station transportation system. Right. There was no receiver at the other end. None was required. All of the operation was done from the Montauk end. The technology for this was beyond terrestrial. It was alien technology, and there was a large contingent of aliens involved with the Phoenix Project in developing the last phase of this, the wormholes in space and time aspect. If any of you are familiar with Dr. Carl Sagan and his books and his commentaries on black holes and space, <clears throat> he talked about the possibility, maybe even the feasibility someday, <coughs> excuse me, of creating wormholes in space and time for travel through the universe without having to go through all of the com encumbrance of large ships and long, uh, tiring voyages. We did it at Montauk. It was done in the period from 1977 until it crashed in 83. The project, by the way, has been replaced. It did crash on 12 August 83 because of various reasons, of sabotage being the primary one. But the project was moved to Germany, West Germany, there's an ongoing leg of it there. Additional stations, later ones, P8 and P9 is what they call them. Now when I say P8 and P9, P1 was the first phase of Philadelphia, which was mind control. P2 was the invisibility prospect. P3 was the program for the uh, wormholes in space and time. There were other interim programs where they made some of this equipment portable. P7 is now on helicopters. It takes three large helicopters to do a mind control number over a whole city. And then you have P-8 and P-9, which is uh, the newer fixed location Phoenix projects. I only have an idea where some of them are located. I do not know if they're operational. I think it's safe to assume they probably are. At least uh, one of those four that I know of is at Lake Michaud, Louisiana area. And that, of course, is a huge NASA base. Uh, two more in the U.S. and one in Canada from my data. Whether any have been built beyond, I don't know. But Phoenix proved that you can transport a person or an object through space. Let us say, if you're going to go from one end of this galaxy, far out of one of the spiral arms, near the you were dealing with a distance of what is classed as 120,000 light years. time. The, the person is inside the tunnel. How and, about the, and the person inside <clears throat> of the tunnel? Well, they will 
we will actually the tunnel goes through and functions as a link to whatever point you connect to and is therefore the time link is for all practical purposes essentially zero it's not absolute zero it may amount to minutes depending on the distance can the guy that was sent beam back radio message that yes I arrived on the planet at this and this time so that you would check theoretically the theoretically it could it could take a video camera with him it could take a radio transmitter receiver setup so they could communicate back or they could use one of the superluminal communication systems which has been conveniently developed during this period where they now have a interplanetary uh, and intragalactic communication system which we didn't build all of but which uh, our government has access to, which is a C8 system. That means it travels at the speed of light to the eighth power across the galaxy with a phase shift, a matter of a fraction of a second. So you That's can operational. Phone to any point of the galaxy without any lag. That is operational, that system, and has been for years. In earlier form was a C6 system, which said there was some delay, and so they had to correct that. They wanted instantaneous communication. Reach out and touch. All right. You can go through my bill if you got the right code numbers. But they're very, very restricted. <laughs>